The message today has to do with beware of false teaching. Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, he warns them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They don't get it. I didn't put this on the sign. I thought if I put beware of yeast, people are going to wonder what is in, came in with Ida. What happened here? Why have we got this craziness going on? They don't get it. They don't understand at first that he's talking about the teaching, the false teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But then, down in verse 12, Jesus is more clear. He says, then at last, they understood that he wasn't speaking about the yeast in bread, but about the deceptive teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They had forgotten bread. Matzah. Well, we know what matzah is. Matzah is what you use at Passover, which is coming up one of these days soon near Easter. It's going to be Passover, be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. If you're going for matzah and you put in yeast, this is what happens. It puffs up. Now, here's one of the things you need to learn and understand. Yeast tends to puff up. False teaching tends to puff up rather than make people humble before the great God we were singing about. There's a lot of puffed up in our world today. And there's a great need to be humble before God. Now here's the point. We need to beware of false ideas that are invading our thinking because they will make us puffed up instead of making us disciples. And that's what we want to be. You don't want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You're a fool. Because the other option doesn't work out well at all. God wants us to serve Him. And Jesus is in the process of making disciples. And He told those disciples, you be in the process of making disciples of all the nations. And that's what this is all about. It's about us becoming followers of Christ, living out Christ's life and Christ's mission of making disciples. And you can't do that if you buy into false teaching. Now we're going to look in Matthew chapter 16. In the first four verses, we're going to see Jesus rebuking the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we'll see why in just a moment. And then we're going to look in just real quickly in detail at this five, verses 5 to 12. We're going to see Jesus interacting with the disciples to where they learn and understand. There's a whole lecture on that about hermeneutics. And I'm not prepared to do that. And I don't know if you want to listen to it anyway. But we probably will cover it a little more later on. And then finally, I want to conclude by looking at some of the errors that Matthew has highlighted so far, errors of the Pharisees and the Sadducees so far, to see if just a little bit of that yeast, a little bit of their false teaching has permeated maybe our thinking, maybe how you look at things. And we want to be sure to root those things out. First of all, in verse chapter 16, verse 1, we find the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to Jesus demanding a sign. Look what it says, in Matthew 16, 1. One day the Pharisees and the Sadducees came to test Jesus. Now this word for test here can also be the word translated tempt Jesus. But more than likely they're trying to test Jesus. They're trying to get him to say something that they can pounce on. They demand, they're demanding that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. Now it's very important that we understand these groups. If you're going to understand the Gospels when you read them, you need to understand some things about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were not compatible groups at all. If they weren't fighting someone else, they were fighting each other. They were arguing about something. Uh, they did not believe the same things. The Sadducees only accepted the law, the first five books of the Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. That's all they accepted of the Scriptures. That was it. That's the only thing they said was authoritative. Only those first five books of the Bible are of Scripture. They have authority. Whereas the Pharisees said, well, all the oral tradition goes along as well. Not just the writings of the prophets, but even the, the, uh, the, the writings of the great rabbis. The tradition that's been handed down. This great tradition 
that's come to us through the synagogues and through the great rabbis, that is authoritative as well. We've got to follow that. Uh, the Sadducees, and this is one reason why they were sad, is because they didn't believe there was any afterlife. Their focus was entirely right now. So for them, it didn't really matter what you believed as long as you don't mess up their apple cart. As long as things keep going along, as long as I can stay in my position and have prosperity, and we don't lose our nation to the Romans, then hang in there and do whatever you want to. But if you're going to threaten my status quo and my prosperity, boy, I don't want to have anything to do with you. The... Uh, Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in resurrection. They believed there were angels and spirits, whereas the Sadducees said there's no such thing. Now, the Sadducees were more conservative and the Pharisees were more liberal. You understand that conservative and liberal are variable terms. It depends on where you slide on the scale. Uh, if you, you can be conservative compared to this person, but liberal compared to somebody else. If you're going to be judged by someone, Harold Homer told me one time, he said, you want to be judged by a Pharisee instead of a Sadducee. Even though the Pharisees were very judged. Because the Pharisees, particularly if you had a Pharisee lawyer, he could figure out how to get you off. He knew the loopholes. He knew the ways around. Sadducee said, you broke the law, you're guilty, that's it. Said, don't do this in the Bible, you did it. Boom, you're done. Pharisee knew a way around. And he would be more liberal. He would be more likely, particularly if he liked you. He'd be more likely to help you get off and give you a lighter sentence. Now, the fact that these two desperate groups are coming together tells you that Jesus has become a threat to the nation. Remember, he's way up in Galilee. And the Sadducees generally are down around Jerusalem. The fact that they and the Pharisees have come up. Remember we read last time about the Pharisees came from Jerusalem? Now you've got Pharisees and Sadducees up here trying to deal with Jesus and trying to figure out what's going on with him. Verse 30, they're asking for these healings. Well, Jesus had already done a great deal of healing. In chapter 15, verse 30, it says, A vast crowd brought to him people who were lame, blind, crippled, those who couldn't speak, and many others. And they laid them before Jesus, and he healed them all. Went down to the hospital yesterday saw a great number of people who were very bad shape, very sick. I left them. They were still in bad shape and very sick. Jesus couldn't do that. If you brought a sick person to Jesus, he would heal that person. He had that ability. He had that power. He had done that numerous times. They should have recognized that that was a sign of the Messiah. As Isaiah says in the Isaiah chapter 35. And when he comes, he will open the eyes of the blind and unplug the ears of the deaf. The lame will leap like a deer. And those who cannot speak will sing for joy. Boy, that's a that's lame leaping like a deer. Have you ever seen a deer leap? Man, that's something. I mean, they they vault. I've seen them vault over fences and roads in front of my school bus one time. They just vaulted over the fence and vaulted. They were on the other side of the road, and boom, they were gone. And I was left my heart pounding uh, there. Springs will gush forth in the wilderness and streams will water the wasteland. Jesus had done many miracles. He had fulfilled what Isaiah said was going to be done by the Messiah. The working of these miracles in the abundant numbers in which Jesus had done was ample evidence that God was working in him. It was proof. He was God's choice. He was one they should have listened to. Not only that, but Jesus had accomplished two separate miracles of feeding, both Matthew and Mark. Tell us about two separate feedings. One with 5,000 men plus that were fed by Jesus. A Jewish crowd. And by the way, when they fed the Jewish crowd, they picked up how many basketfuls left over? It's on the screen, folks. Just read it. Yes, 12. And when he was dealing, as, as uh, the scripture in the previous passage talks about the feeding of the 4,000, those were mostly Gentile, and they picked up seven basketfuls left over. Now, I don't know all the symbolic of that number, but seven is using the number of perfection. He had completed that, but the very fact that you're able to take a few fish and a little bit of bread, and you're able to feed 4,000 men, that's a miracle. 
He had demonstrated clearly what was wrong with these signs in their mind. Well, for them, they did not consider those miracles. They had already concluded these things are done by demons. Back in chapter 9, verse 54, or verse 34, the Pharisees said, He can cast out demons because he is empowered by the prince of demons. We'll come back to that statement. Later on in chapter 12, when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, no wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. So they're testing Jesus, but they don't believe. They're not looking for proof that he's Messiah. They're looking for something they can accuse him of. What are they looking for? A sign from heaven. Well, they could be talking about a sign that's clearly from God, although I would think a miracle. Miracle of feeding, you would say those abundance of those sort of says God is working with this guy. Remember we talked about last week, the fact that he'd been in a Gentile territory and he healed Gentiles and then he comes back and he's still healing people. The power of God is still with him. It says God is still with him even though he has not followed their rules of washing and cleansing when coming back into the land. God is still with him even though he's violating their rules. They could have been looking for something like the rainbow that God gave Noah as the sign of the covenant of the uh, after the flood. There wouldn't be another flood. Next time it's going to be, the world's not going to be destroyed by water. It's going to be destroyed by fire next time. They could be talking about another heavenly sign, the sign of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was dying. And he appealed to the Lord. And the Lord told, sent a prophet to tell him, get your house in order, you're going to die. And then he cried out to the Lord. And the Lord told the prophet, go back and tell him, okay, I'll give you 15 more years. And the question was, well, what's the sign? How will I know? So the Lord said, I'll give you a sign. Either the shadows on the steps can go down 15 or back 15. He said, well, it always goes down 15. Make it go back 15. And so the sun went backwards. The shadow on the stairs that he could see went backwards, showing the sun had gone backwards. That was a miracle of God, a miracle in the heavens. God had changed that. Maybe that's what they were talking about. Show me some sign like that. Show me a sign in the heavens. D.A. Carson is, contends this. He says, they were asking for a sign performed on command to remove what seemed to them to be the ambiguity of Jesus' miracles. But they were not ambiguous. Their plan was to kill him. They were looking for a pretext by which they could kill Jesus. That's my opinion. Then the Pharisees, chapter 12, verse 14, called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. You've got to understand, these religious people, these holy people, these people who believe that the status quo was all there ever was going to be, and we're going to make money off of everything, and we're going to be in position. We don't want to lose our nation. They saw Jesus as a threat and they had determined we're going to kill him. How are they going to do that? Well, it, it tells us, go to the next one, please. The disciples came to him and said, do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you just said? Jesus is not concerned about the Pharisees or the Sadducees because he knows they're going to kill him. That's part of the plan. We'll see more of that Lord willing next week. He knows that's the plan. He knows that's exactly what's going to happen. Genesis, uh, De Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, chapter 13 tells us this truth. Here's what I think they were going to use the pretext for. Here's how they were going to kill it. It says, suppose there were prophets among you or those who dream dreams about the future and they promise you signs or miracles and the predicted signs and miracles occur. In other words, you ask them for a sign, and they give you a sign. And if they say, come, let us worship other gods, gods you have not known before, do not listen to them. The Lord your God is testing you to see if you truly love him with all your heart and soul. Serve only the Lord your God and fear him only. Obey his commands and listen to his voice. Cling to him. They were commanded to get rid of that prophet. That's what they were saying. That's what I believe they were doing. They were testing Jesus 
for a pretext to say you are a false prophet. You gave us a sign in the heavens, but you're teaching the doctrines of the devil. You're teaching against the things the great rabbis have said. You are not following the Jewish laws. You're not following the ways of Judaism. By the way, that's what's still said today. That's still the rejection of Jesus Christ. He wasn't Jewish enough to be the Messiah. The Messiah has to be a great rabbi in our tradition who follows along with what we have said and what we contend, what has been taught the way we do it. And the fact that Jesus, a Jew, was a rabbi, a teacher, a Messiah declared by God, demonstrated by the miracles of God, means nothing. He must be false because he does not follow the teachings that we do. That was their logic, and that's how they were going to go about it. Jesus offers a devastating rebuke, rebuke of them, or rebuttal of them. He says this, you know how to interpret the signs of the weather. Maybe you know this limber. Mm -hmm. Red sky at night. Anybody know that? Yep. Was it red sky delight. at night? Sailor's, Sailor's delight. delight. Red sky at morning. Sailor take warning. Now that's not the one Jesus quoted. They had one very similar. And they can say, well, I can look and see that it's red sky, we've got clouds, as the sun's going down. It means the weather's past us. Move. See, remember, they've got, they're on an east-west orientation. It comes off and it's moving that way. Well, if that's gone, then okay, it's done. We're going to have good weather tomorrow. It's the other way. Man, look out to the west, Mediterranean Sea. Boy, what a sunset. Man, that's big clouds coming this way. We're going to have rain tomorrow. They can figure that out. That's pretty simple. Now, by the way, it doesn't work everywhere in the world. That's why sometimes when people translate this, they translate it differently. In fact, even in ancient times, when they translated for Egypt, they changed the metaphor because it doesn't work in Egypt. West is the desert. You're not ever going to get rain coming from there. Don't have to worry about that. That's not an applicable thing there. But it depends on where you are, but you can figure those things out. It's pretty obvious. You know that. But he says you're ignorant of the Scripture. You don't know the signs of the times. You can't figure out what's going on. You don't know the signs of the times. I believe he's talking plural here. They can tell the sign of the weather, but they don't know the signs, plural, of the times. What's he talking about? He's talking about the miracles that he had done. They didn't take any of those miracles into account. He had given them sign after sign after sign after sign so they would know this is true to the Messiah. They didn't discern what God was doing in their day. They didn't know the scriptures and they didn't know the signs that God was giving them. If they had known the scriptures and believed the scriptures, they would have understood the signs. How important is it that you and I not only know the scriptures, but we're able to look around us and see the signs and see the working out of what God is doing. As you look at the scriptures, and then as you watch the news, you read what's going on, you see what's happening around you in the world, even in our own community, you should be able to discern one thing clearly. God's right. God's right. What God said is exactly true. He's never lied. He's never been wrong about anything. What he says is exactly true. What he says is going to happen, is going to happen, is happening, and is still going to happen. He's never been wrong about anything. Keep watching, and you'll figure that out. You'll see that, and it will help you. Jesus had already told them, but if I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, remember they said, you're doing it by Satan, he said, if I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. That was the signs of the times. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the one. Jesus is the Messiah. This one who was born of a virgin. This one who came and dwelt among us. This one who died and rose again. This is the one. And the only hope you and I have the only hope anybody in this world has is Jesus is the one. 
There is no other hope. You and I are all going to come to the end of our day. And the only hope we could possibly have is Jesus. If you come to the end of the days and your hope is there's no afterlife. Not a very sure hope. We've already had somebody go to the afterlife and come back. We know there's an afterlife. We know the people who die come back. We've seen resurrections. They've been vouchsafed to us. We know there is an afterlife. We know that it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. We know that's going to happen. The only hope we have is Jesus Christ. Stuart Weber remarks this. He says he was not saying, Jesus was not saying it was wrong to test the validity of a person who claims to be God's prophet. There are many today that make that claim. Only that it was wrong to test him when he had already proven his validity. Continued testing demonstrated the hard hearts of the Pharisees, the persons who were seeking the sign. I'm sorry, that's what he's saying. Jesus said the only sign going to give, be given to this evil and adulterous generation is the sign of Jonah. What in the world is the sign of Jonah? Well, Luke tells us this. Luke chapter 11, verse 30 says this. What happened to him, that is to Jesus, was a sign to, the, to Jonah, was a sign to the people of Nineveh that God had sent him. That is, Jonah had been swallowed by a whale, by a great fish, I'm sorry, I fell into the vernacular. And they spit him out on the land, and when Jonah went into the city, he looked bleached out. He looked like he'd been in the belly of a fish for three days. Uh, he was in terrible shape. He looked like a man who had risen from the dead. When you read Jonah chapter 2, you recognize he may well have died and risen to life. He goes on to say in Luke, What happens to the Son of Man will be a sign to these people that he was sent by God. I remark about the graciousness of God. That even to the people who had him crucified, God said, I'll give you one more sign. My son whom you crucified, I will raise from the dead. I'll give you one more sign. If you don't believe the miracles, believe this one. I have raised him from the dead and given abundant proof that Jesus who died came back to life. God says, I'll give you one more gracious sign, you Pharisees, you Sadducees, you who have rejected my son and all the miracles, all the signs of the times that I showed you, I'll give you this one great sign. And sadly, many of these men will stand before Jesus at the judgment seat and have to recognize that they rejected even this gracious, merciful sign of God to them that they might turn. Thankfully, I read in Acts chapter 2 that thousands of them Later on in chapter 4 and chapter 5, that many of the scribes of, of the Pharisees had turned to the Lord after they saw that final sign. We have a merciful God. I'm glad we have a merciful God because like the disciples, we can be pretty dense. Jesus had some dense disciples. I'm not knocking them. I'm taking hope in them. Because just like they don't get things, I don't get stuff. Don't you feel dense sometimes? You know what I mean by dense? I'm trying not to say dumb. But you look at things and you think, how did I miss that? How could I have read the Bible for years and not seen that? How slow can I be? Jesus tells them, you beware, they're yeast. Disciples are there, they're wondering about, we don't have enough bread. We didn't bring bread. Oh, we got bread. Wow. And they're beating themselves up over that. Jesus says, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He says, it's because we don't have bread. Boy, we've really upset Jesus. Jesus said, watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees. And they began to say, it's because we don't have any bread. And finally Jesus said, look, your problem is you don't have enough faith. You're not thinking with the eyes of faith. He calls it, oh ye of little faith. It's one word. Oh ye of little faith. Think about it just for a minute. Why are you talking about having no bread? Look what it says in the next verse. Don't you understand even yet? You remember the 5,000 I fed with five loaves and two fishes? Five loaves. How many basketfuls of leftovers did you pick up? 
Or the 4,000 I fed with seven loaves and the large basket of leftovers you picked up. I've already shown you, think with faith. Think with faith. Don't worry about the bread. Here's a guy, they're with a guy who can take almost nothing and feed thousands. There's 12, 13 of them in the boat. Maybe a few more. Do they really think Jesus would have trouble, would be getting on to them? You didn't bring bread. Now what are we going to do? Like he's panicking. No. Think about it. I'm not talking, I couldn't be talking about bread. I could make bread. That's no biggie. I'm talking about something else. He says, why can't you understand that I'm not talking about bread? So again I say, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then they get it. Their eyes of faith kicked in. Oh, we're with a guy. He can make bread. He's not. Oh, he must mean the teaching. The deceptive teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now let me very quickly. And I'm going to do this real quickly. Maybe, uh, in fact, I think probably next week I'm going to come back. So you may want to fill this out in my sermon app. Or you may write these down. I want to cover it with you. The deadly false yeast of teaching we've seen already in Matthew. And uh, Lord will, we'll come back to this next week. Now, let me give you some things. And the reason I say these is because Jesus says beware of these things. And I think it's good for us to remind ourselves what have we seen that they believe, and here's the point, that I might have bought into myself. Let me give you some of these things really quickly. Matthew chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. That birthright produces salvation. Sometimes people tend to think that because my parents are believers, I'm a believer. Because my parents are Christian, I'm a Christian. Because my parents are going to heaven, I must be going to heaven. After all, I was born in the USA. If I was born in the USA, I must be a Christian, I must be going to heaven. I might be a problem. Not correct at all. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 20 and 22. You write these down. This is a very common one. Today, we'll talk more about this, Lord willing, next week. Good enough is acceptable. As long as I'm good enough. After all, I haven't killed anybody. My sins aren't real bad. The whole Sermon on the Mount, remember the point was, you've heard it said, but I tell you, if that's your standard, it's not high enough. Our standard is is Jesus Christ. Our standard is God. Unless we're as righteous as God, why would He let us into heaven? Why would He tolerate us in His presence? The standard is not this lowered standard. No. Uh, it's a much greater standard. Let me give you the next one. In Matthew chapter 9 verses 11 to 13, the concept that ritual trumps mercy. That God's more concerned that you be at church than that you treat your neighbor right. Now you should be at church. The exact quote is, sacrifice is more important than showing mercy. It's okay for me to pick on somebody, to criticize somebody, to not show somebody mercy, as long as I make the right sacrifice, as long as I keep up the worship, as long as I follow the religion, as long as you do the religious things, as long as you keep up with the rituals and you offer the right sacrifice at the right time and you pray at the right time and you wash your hands at the right time, as long as I do those things, God's not so worried about how I live and how I treat other people. In fact, He's willing to say, well, as long as you're doing that, this other's good enough. You're good enough on that. Let me give you another one. Down in Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 and 34. They were going to say that the Spirit's work, they did say the Spirit's work is satanic. Remember, that's where he said he's casting out demons by the prince of demons. Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Satan. That's how he's doing it. What they were saying is that what Satan, that what Satan, the Spirit was doing, they were attributing that to the works of Satan. That's always a dangerous thing to do. Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 to 12. Possessions are more important than people. It's about the woman that was needed to be healed. It's all right to heal on the Sabbath day. And he said, wouldn't you go pick up your sheep? If your sheep fell in the pit, would you pick it up? And 
get it out. But you're not going to allow this woman or this man, I've forgotten which it was, there's a man with a withered hand, a deformed hand. You're not going to allow this man to be healed on the Sabbath. You're going to say it's wrong to heal him on the Sabbath. What you're saying is your sheep is more important than this man. You got your values mixed up. And most people do because we tend to value what belongs to me more than we value what belongs to God. That is other people. And that's a very dangerous thing to creep into uh, thinking. And then, this is the last one. Matthew chapter 15, verse 3. Tradition trumps Scripture. Whatever our traditional teaching is, that trumps Scripture. Matthew 15, 3. We talked about this last week. We talked about all these as we've gone through. But, why do you by your traditions violate the direct commands of God? The Bible says, honor your father and your mother. Whoever talks bad about their father and mother, that person needs to die. Sounds like God wants you to honor your father and mother, right? Sounds like a very important thing. I see parents looking at their kid thing. I sure hope you're paying attention right now. How many of y'all have parents? Have parents? Okay. You're on both sides of this one. Wow. The Pharisees said, well, as long as you dedicate it to God, you don't have to give it to mom and dad. It'd be the more righteous thing is to honor God with your possessions than to take care of your mother and dad. And Jesus said, by your commandment, by your rule, you figured a way to teach people to violate the direct command of God in order that you can do what you want to do. There's a lot of people falling for that error even in our day. That what I want to do, what I think is right, what makes me feel good, even though it is violating God's direct commandments, I'm going to do that. We'll skip the other, but let me just suggest this as a conclusion of this. And you think about these, I want you to ask yourself this week, have I accepted one of these false teachings? Have I accepted one of these? And I trust you'll study these this week. By the way, they're in my sermon app with the reference there with me. Lord willing, we'll talk about them a little more next week. Here's the suggestion for correcting these things. Number one, recognize there's a little bit of that yeast of false teaching in my thinking. Number two, reject it. As much human wisdom as there might be about it, Recognize I've let just this little bit. Don't tolerate the fact that you've got a little bit of false teaching. Reject it and replace it with God's truth. And that will be the solution to this. That's what he wants the disciples to do. Beware the incipient fact, the incipientness of small bits of yeast and their ability to ruin that which ought to be holy before God. False ideas have a way of tearing us up. I'm going to review this, and then I'm going to talk about, Lord willing, next week, this is the plan. I'm going to talk about the Christian false teaching that crept into the life of the disciple. And it's the most common false teaching I see today in the church. And that's in chapter 16 as well. So that'll give you a little tease for studying the passage and studying these things. Let's go to order. Lord, as David quoted earlier, we have sung about, your word is true. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is true. Lord, we come before you at least academically recognizing there's some falsehoods in our life. Some ideas that we've been taught, we've accepted, Lord, that are culturally acceptable. And yet, Lord, they're false as can be. And they will ruin our Christian life and our walk with you unless we recognize those things and sweep them clean from our life. Lord, I pray that you'll challenge this week as we read the scriptures cited, as we think about what you taught so far in Matthew. And we'll recognize you'll point out through your Holy Spirit things that we have accepted as false, as true. And Lord, that they really are false. 
Lord, we pray that you'll scrub those from our minds. Lord, you point them out. Father, as we interact with your word, we'll replace them with the truth that Jesus taught. Lord, no matter how challenging these are. Father, we recognize that before next Sunday, we might not be here. We may be standing before you. Lord, we pray that you will sanctify us in truth. And Lord, that most importantly, that we'll put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the one we know you're satisfied with. And Father, put our trust and hope that since we have believed in him, and that what he did on the cross paid fully all of our sins. Lord, you will save us because of him, because of our faith in him. And Lord, that you'll continue that work either here or on the day of his coming. We ask this in Christ's name.